Uh, hi everyone, this is Dr. Ahmed Al Nabawi, lecturer of anatomy and embryology. Uh, and in this uh, presentation, inshallah, we will discuss the anatomy of the oral cavity, the anatomy of the cerebral gland, and esophagus. And we will begin talking about the oral cavity. And uh, number one, we will talk about the boundaries of the oral cavity. So let's understand this figure first. This is sagittal section in the area of head and neck. Okay? So we cut here, this is the skull, so this is the base of the skull. And below it, this is the vertebral column, the cervical vertebrae. Okay. Uh, in this region, we can see here, this is the nasal septum, which lies in between the two halves of the nasal cavity. And below this, this area, this is the oral cavity. Okay. This is our oral cavity. So let's see what are the boundaries of the oral cavity. Uh, so superiorly, superiorly, we have the roof. What, uh, what, uh, 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 the roof of the oral cavity is formed by a hard part, this part. This is called hard palate. Okay. Behind it, we have soft part. This is called soft palate. So the roof of the oral cavity is named palate. And this is two part, anteriorly hard palate, posteriorly soft palate. Number two, about the inferior boundary or the roof of the oral cavity. We have what? We have this. What is this? This is the tongue. So, uh, so the floor of the oral cavity is formed by the anterior two-third of the tongue. This is the anterior two-third. This is the posterior one third. So the anterior two third of the tongue forms the floor of the oral cavity, and underneath it, here in this region, we have the floor, we have this area. It's called the floor of the mouth. So we have the floor of the mouth anteriorly, and we have the anterior two thirds of the tongue. This forms the floor of the oral cavity. After this, anteriorly and on the sides, anteriorly we have this, this soft areas. You know, this is called lips. So anteriorly we have the lips, the lips, the two lips, upper lip and lower lip. And on the sides we have the cheeks, as we know, we have the cheeks on the sides, so anteriorly and on, and on both sides, lips and cheeks. Lastly, posteriorly, posteriorly the oral cavity will open here in this tube, this tube is called the pharynx, and this is the upper part of the pharynx is called nasopharynx, and this part is called oropharynx. So posteriorly, the oral cavity will open on the oropharynx, and this opening, which communicates the oral cavity with the oropharynx, is called oropharyngeal isthmus. So we have posteriorly the oropharyngeal isthmus, which is the opening which connects the oral cavity to the uh, oropharynx. Okay. So to see the oropharyngeal isthmus on uh, uh, in detail, we will have this figure. This figure we open the oral cavity like this. Okay. So this is the roof of the oral cavity, hard palate behind it, soft palate, and the most posterior part of the soft palate is called uvula. This is the floor of the oral cavity formed by the anterior two-third of the tongue. So this opening here, here, this is the palate, this is the tongue, and this uh, and this two folds. We have right fold here and left fold here. These two folds is called bilateral folds. So folds connecting the palate to the tongue, bilateral folds. So this opening, this opening, this is the oropharyngeal isthmus. So the oropharyngeal isthmus have boundaries. What are the boundaries? Okay, it's bounded superiorly by the soft palate. Okay, inferiorly by the tongue. On the sides we have the bilateral folds. This is the bilateral folds. And by the way, we should know that the bilateral folds is formed by a muscle. We have muscle from the belly to the to the tongue called bilateral covered by mucous membrane. So this is the bilateral fold. Two muscles on the two sides, bilateral muscle, covered by mucous membrane. So this is about the oropharyngeal isthmus. So we, we talked about the boundaries of the oral cavity. Number two, the divisions of the oral cavity. The oral cavity is divided into two regions. Vestibule of the oral cavity, which lies outside to the uh, to, to the gums and teeth, is called vestibule. Outside of it, between the lips and the teeth and gums, called vestibule. Okay, so this is the cavity between the lips and cheeks externally, and teeth and gums internally. Okay, and so this is the vestibule, and inside we have here, this is the mouth cavity proper, which is bounded by the teeth and which lies inside to the teeth and gums. So it's the cavity behind the teeth and the gums is called oral uh, or mouth cavity proper. The two cavities, the vestibule and the mouth cavity proper, they are they communicate behind the last molar tooth. We have communication between both. Okay, about the features in the floor of the mouth. Let's look to the floor of the mouth. So this is the mouth cavity. This is the inferior surface of the tongue. So this is the floor of the mouth cavity. What we have in the floor of the mouth cavity, we have a fold, this fold, which connects the floor of the mouth to the inferior surface of the tongue called the frenulum. 
So it's called the frenion of the tongue. On both sides of the frenion of the tongue, we have a small elevation here. It's called sublingual papilla. Sublingual papilla. This is the sublingual papilla. And the sublingual papilla receives opening of the submandibular salivary gland. Very important. So we have here the opening of the submandibular salivary gland. Lateral to the sublingual papilla, we have a longitudinal elevation. This is called sublingual fold. The sublingual fold is formed by the sublingual cerebral gland, and the opening of the sublingual cerebral gland is on the surface of the sublingual fold. Again, so we have frenulum. This is the frenulum on the tongue. On both sides, we have the sublingual papilla. The sublingual papilla receives the opening of the submandibular cerebral gland. Later to the sublingual papilla, we have the sublingual fold formed by the sublingual cerebral gland, and the opening of the sublingual cerebral gland lies on the surface of the sublingual fold. Okay. So, what are the glands which open in the mouth cavity? We have the ducts of the cerebral gland. What ducts? We have the duct of the parotid duct, okay, of the parotid gland. We have the duct of the submandibular gland. We have the duct of the sublingual gland. Okay, and uh, and of course the, the minor mucous gland, which is scattered uh, all around the mouth cavity. The two large gland, the duct of the parotid gland, is, is located here. In which area? This is the vestibule or the mouth cavity proper. This is the vestibule of the mouth cavity. So the duct of the parotid gland lies in the vestibule, okay, in the vestibule of the mouth cavity, okay. Opposite which tooth? Opposite this tooth, which is the upper second molar, okay. So the vestibule opposite the upper second molar. Where the submandibular and the sublingual gland? lies in the floor as we said before okay the submandibular gland opens in the sublingual papilla while the sublingual gland lies on the sublingual fold so in this figure we can see this is the submandibular cerebral gland so the submandibular cerebral gland lies in the floor of the mouth okay this is the duct of the submandibular cerebral gland it runs beneath the floor of the mouth to open here on this elevation this is the sublingual papilla okay so in the sublingual papilla, lateral to the just lateral to the frenulum, this is the opening of the submandibular cerebral gland. While this is the sublingual cerebral gland, which causes the elevation, which is called the sublingual fold. And we can notice that the sublingual cerebral gland has multiple open, multiple ducts, not just a single duct like the submandibular duct. Okay, multiple ducts from eight to twenty ducts, and they open on the surface of the sublingual fold. So if you return here, where is the opening of the uh, of the glands? The parotid, okay, lies in the vestibule of the mouth opposite the upper second molar. The submandibular gland in the floor on each side of the frenulum on the surface of the sublingual papilla. The submandibular gland on the floor at the surface of the sublingual fold. Okay. So this is a real uh, picture. We can see here this is the frenulum of the tongue. And this elevation, this is the sublingual papilla which contains the opening of the submandibular duct. And this elevation, this is the sublingual fold, okay, which contains the, the multiple opening of the sublingual gland. Okay. About the nerve supply of the mouth cavity, about the sensory nerve supply of the mouth cavity, the roof of the mouth cavity is supplied by multiple branches of one nerve, which is called maxillary nerve. So the roof, the roof, okay, the, uh, the roof of the mouth cavity, which is called the palate, is supplied by branches of the maxillary nerve. While the floor and the cheeks, the floor and the cheeks are supplied by branches of the mandibular gland, uh, of the mandibular nerve. So we have the maxillary nerve for the roof, the mandibular nerve for the floor and the cheeks. Blood supply of the mouth cavity also supplied by multiple arteries like this one, this is called the facial artery which supply the lips, okay. Like this artery, this is called the lingual artery which supply the floor of the mouth cavity. Okay, like the maxillary artery, this is the maxillary artery which gives multiple branches to the roof and the sides of the mouth cavity. About the lymph drainage of the mouth cavity, you have three group of lymph nodes. Number one, this group which is called submental lymph nodes, lies just below the chin. The submandibular lymph node which lies below the mandible. And this lymph node which runs around the internal jugular vein, this is called deep cervical lymph nodes. So three groups, submental, submandibular, deep cervical lymph nodes. With the mucosa of the oral cavity, we can notice that we have three types of mucosa. Number one is called masticatory mucosa. Masticatory mucosa forms about 25% of the total mucosa, and this is uh, this is for lining of the hard parts of the oral cavity, like the heart palate and the gingiva, the bony parts. It's called masticatory mucosa. And the type of mucosa in this masticatory mucosa is, is keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. 
while the lining mucosa which lines the soft parts of the oral cavity about 60% of the total mucosa uh, so it will it cover the floor of the mouth the inferior surface of the tongue okay no the inferior surface not the superior surface the alveolar mucosa cheeks lips and soft palate okay this is non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and lastly the dorsum of the tongue the, the upper surface of the tongue is called dorsum contains specialized mucosa named taste buds taste buds is concerned with taste sensation so this is the masticatory mucosa, okay, which is confined to the pony parts like the gums, okay, like also the heart palate, okay, like this. This is the lining mucosa which covers the soft parts like the lips, okay, like the uh, like the cheeks from inside, like the inferior surface of the tongue, like the floor of the mouth. It's called lining mucosa. Okay, this is non non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And lastly, the dorsum of the tongue is covered by specialized mucosa taste buds for perception of taste sensation. Uh, one important thing to, to, to note about the oral cavity, the teeth. Okay? The teeth, as we know, we have two types of teeth. We have something called milk teeth or deciduous teeth. Okay? And we have the other types called permanent teeth. Okay? About the deciduous teeth or milk teeth. Okay? We, we need to know the number, they are about uh, 20 in number, 10 above in the upper jaw and 10 below in the lower jaw. And they begin to erupt at the age of 6 months, at the age of 6 months they begin to appear and they are completed about uh, at the age of 2 years. Okay? And we know that the teeth are temporary okay? and they are lost and they are replaced uh, later on by the permanent teeth. Okay? Uh, about their number. Uh, or about their distribution, the upper 40, they are called incisors. So the incisors, central and lateral incisors. Okay. Then we have uh, two canines, one on each side of the jaw, and then we have four molar, two on each side. This is in each jaw. About the permanent teeth, the permanent teeth, they are about, about 32 in number. We have 16 above and 16 below in the upper jaw and in the lower jaw, and the distribution is shown here. We have uh, we have central incisors, two central incisors, two lateral incisors. So we have four incisors in each jaw. Okay. Then we have two canine in each jaw, and we have uh, four premolar in each jaw, two right and two left. Okay. Then we have uh, six molar in each jaw, three on the right and three on the right, on the left, and the last one, the third molar. You know this is called wisdom tooth, which appear at the age of uh, eighteen years. About the blood supply and nerve supply of the of the teeth, blood supply of the teeth they are all derived from this artery it's called maxillary artery. So the blood supply by the maxillary artery. About the nerve supply, like the mouth, like as we as we said with the oral cavity, the upper teeth are innervated by the maxillary nerve. This is the maxillary nerve, okay, which supplies the upper teeth, while the lower teeth are innervated by this nerve, which is called the mandibular nerve. So the maxillary nerve supplies the upper teeth, the mandibular nerve supplies the lower teeth. So we finished talking about the teeth. One other structure, important structure located in the oral cavity is the tongue. Okay, what is the tongue? The tongue is a muscular organ, as we see here. This is the tongue. Okay, what are the parts of the tongue? Let's begin by saying that the anterior end of the tongue is called tip of the tongue. Okay, this is the tip. Okay. While we have the root of the tongue which attaches the tongue to the floor of the mouth. So our tongue is attached to the floor of the mouth by the root of the tongue. Okay? So we have tip at the anterior end. We have root, the root, the site of attachment to the floor of the mouth. We have surfaces of the tongue. How many surfaces? We have uh, two surfaces. We have upper surface and lower surface. The upper surface is very important. It's called dorsum of the tongue or dorsal surface. So this is the dorsal surface or the dorsum of the tongue. Okay. It's directed airport, okay, and it's divided by a sulcus. This sulcus is called sulcus terminalis. So this is the sulcus terminalis. It will divide the dorsum of the tongue into anterior two thirds, which is called oral part, okay, and posterior one third, which is called pharyngeal part. So this is the oral part. This is the oral part anteriorly, and this is the pharyngeal part posteriorly. Anterior two third and posterior one third, okay. At the apex of the sulcus terminalis, the sulcus terminalis is V-shaped, and the apex of this V we have here a depression called foramen cecum, and from the foramen cecum to the tip we have uh, a septum which which uh, which divides the tongue into two similar halves. Okay. 
about the inferior surface of the tongue this is the inferior surface of our tongue what we have we know already that we have frenulum which connect the inferior surface to the floor of the mouth and on the sides of the frenulum if you remove the mucous membrane you will notice some nerves and vessels these nerves and vessels are called lingual nerve and lingual vessels so this is the lingual nerve and lingual vessels lies on each side of the frenulum of the tongue Uh, this figure to show the, the root, so the, the site of attachment of the tongue, so the tongue is attached here to the floor of the mouth, here at the root of the tongue, so it's called the root. About the muscles of the tongue, and we, uh, I will tell you that the, the tongue or the muscles of the tongue are two groups, we have extrinsic group and we have intrinsic group. Why, why we name them intrinsic? We name them intrinsic because they are, they come from uh, from areas outside of the tongue attach then and attached to the tongue so from areas outside of the tongue to the tongue so they are called extrinsic group while the intrinsic group they are uh, they lies wholly inside the tongue they have no attachment to any area outside the tongue so the, the, the extrinsic comes from areas outside of the tongue to the tongue while the intrinsic they are located entirely inside the tongue with no attachment outside the tongue what are the extrinsic group we have number one this fan shaped large muscle it's called this one's called genioglossus so this is genioglossus okay this is called a genioglossus muscle it's fan shaped it comes from the mandible and it uh, it's uh, it's attached all around the tongue from its apex to its base okay to its root yeah okay this is called genioglossus we have also so so this one this is the genioglossus which comes from the mandible okay from the hyoid bone we have other muscles called hyoglossus okay from this pony projection from the skull it's called the styloid process it's called the styloglossus okay so we have genioglossus we have hyoglossus we have styloglossus okay let's try to understand the action of each one the hyoglossus will move the tongue downward very clear the styloglossus will move the tongue upward and backward, very clear. The genioglossus, on, uh, if it acts on one side, it will push the tongue to the other side. Okay, so if the right genioglossus act, it will push the tongue to the left side. While uh, if the left genioglossus act, it will move the tongue to the right side. So each genioglossus will push the tongue to the opposite side. When the two genioglossus act together, they will push the tongue forward to protrude it outside. So when you protrude your tongue outside, you use your genioglossus. Okay. So again in this figure, this is the genioglossus as we said. This is the hyoglossus. And this one from the skull, this is the styloglossus. I can note that we have a fourth one, this one, from the palate to the tongue. So this is the palatoglossus, which we saw when we talked about the palatoglossal fold. So this is the palatoglossus and this one will approximate the tongue to the palate to help in swallowing okay so this is the four uh, extrinsic muscles so the extrinsic muscles they are four in number okay genioglossus hyoglossus styloglossus palatoglossus okay about the intrinsic group we have all the intrinsic muscles we have this figure we can see the intrinsic muscles we have some muscles called longitudinal group this longitudinal muscles the begins from the root of the tongue ends at the tips like this so they run from the whole length of the tongue so they are longitudinal we have some of them lies just beneath the dorsal of the tongue it's called superior longitudinal muscles we have others runs uh, from the root to the tip but located just uh, just uh, uh, at the inferior surface so it's called inferior longitudinal group so we have superior longitudinal group inferior longitudinal group and both when act they will curl the tongue the superior longitudinal will curl the tip of the tongue upward and backward while the inferior longitudinal they will curl the tip of the tongue downward okay so this is the longitudinal group we have some muscles arise from the side to the midline like this so rise horizontally Okay. they are called the transverse group when the transverse group act they will compress the tongue from side to side increasing its vertical diameter okay we have other groups which runs from the dorsum to the inferior surface so this is they are called vertical group this vertical group when act they will compress the tongue from above to downward okay to flatten the tongue so they, they are called vertical group so the intrinsic muscles are longitudinal, superior longitudinal, inferior longitudinal, vertical, and transverse groups. Okay, so this is the intrinsic group.
Okay. Uh, if you talk about the nerve supply of the muscles of the tongue, the motor innervation of the tongue, I will tell you just one very important sentence that all the muscles of the tongue, intrinsic and extrinsic, they are supplied by one nerve which is called the hypoglossal nerve, the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, except just one which is called the palatoglossus which runs in the palatoglossal fold. It's, uh, this palatoglossus is supplied by something called vagal accessory complex or we can say simply the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. Okay. So all the muscles of the tongue by the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal, except one palatoglossus by the vagus, the 10th cranial nerve. Okay. So that's about the motor innervation. So we can, we'll begin by the motor innervation of the tongue. I will tell you that all the intrinsic and the extrinsic muscles of the tongue are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve. This is the hypoglossal nerve, which will supply all the muscles. Okay. Except just one, which is the palatoglossus, it's supplied by the pharyngeal plexus or vagal accessory complex, or we can say, simply say the vagus nerve, the tenth cranial nerve. Okay. So that's about the motor innervation. What about the sensory innervation of the tongue? Very, very important to know the sensory innervation of the tongue. Uh, what, what, first, what are the types of sensation of the tongue? The tongue receives two types of, of sensation. General sensation, the touch, the temperature, the pain, this is called general sensation. And it receives also special sensation, which is the taste through the taste buds. So we have general sensation and taste sensation. Okay, let's begin by the anterior two thirds of the tongue. This is the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Okay, the anterior two thirds of the tongue receives general sensation by nerve called lingual nerve, which runs on the inferior surface of the tongue. Remember this lingual nerve. Okay, this lingual nerve it comes from the trigeminal mandibular, which is the fifth cranial nerve. Okay, so lingual nerve, general sensation for the anterior two thirds of the tongue. While the anterior two thirds two -third of the tongue receives taste sensation by a nerve called corda tympani. Corda tympani is a branch of the facial of the seventh cranial nerve. So we can say the anterior two thirds of the tongue, general sensation, lingual, which is branch from trigeminal fifth cranial nerve. While taste sensation from the corda tympani, which is a branch from the facial, the seventh cranial nerve. This is the anterior two thirds of the tongue. What about the posterior one third of the tongue, the pharyngeal part of the tongue? It receives general and the taste sensation both by the ninth cranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, general and taste. Okay. While the most posterior part of the tongue, with this elevation behind it, which is called epiglottis, also contains some taste buds. Okay. The most posterior part of the tongue and the epiglottis, general and taste sensation by the vagus nerve, the tenth cranial nerve. So that's about the sensory innervation of the tongue. It's very, very important. So we, we talked about the innervation of the tongue, sensory and motor. Blood supply of the tongue. Blood supply, we have arteries, we have veins, we have lymph. Arterial supply of the tongue comes from this artery. What is this artery, Shabab? This is called lingual artery. Lingual artery. This is the lingual artery which runs deep to hyoglossus muscle. This is called lingual artery. Okay. The lingual artery will supply the tongue by some branches. Like some branches will supply the posterior part of the tongue called dorsal lingual arteries. They run deep to high glossus, so it's not shown in this figure, dorsal lingual arteries. While uh, it gives a branch to the floor of the tongue called sublingual artery, this is the sublingual artery. Okay, and it will terminate by giving deep lingual artery which runs on the inferior surface of the tongue, deep lingual artery. Okay, so this is the sublingual artery. Okay, this is the deep lingual artery. In other figure, I will show you the dorsal lingual. Look to this. This is the lingual artery. Runs deep to the hyoglossus. As we said, we, we, we cut the hyoglossus to show you this artery. But this is the dorsal lingual artery. It, it, usually, there are two or three branches. But in this figure, we just show one. This is the dorsal lingual artery. Okay, And this is the sublingual artery, which is supplied to the, the floor of the mouth. And this one, this is the deep artery of the tongue. Or deep lingual artery. This is about the arterial supply. What about the venous drainage, like the arterial supply? Okay, we have dorsal deep lingual veins. This is the deep lingual veins which runs along the uh, along the deep lingual artery, deep lingual vein. This deep lingual vein will end by opening into two veins along the hypoglossal nerve. These two veins are called vena comitant of the hypoglossal nerve. Okay, this vena comitant of the hypoglossal nerve will unite with two veins runs along. The lingual artery is called vena comitant of the lingual artery. Okay, so vena comitant of the hypoglossal nerve unite with the vena comitant of the lingual artery at the posterior border of hyoglossus to form the lingual vein. Okay, 
So the artery is supplied with the tongue by the lingual artery. It's the main artery. It comes from the external carotid artery. It runs along the inferior surface of the tongue as the deep lingual artery, as we said, or deep artery of the tongue. Okay, it gives the deep artery of the tongue, and it gives also the dorsal lingual arteries, and it gives also the sublingual artery, as we said. The venous drainage, we have the deep lingual vein, which open into the vena comitant of the hypoglossal nerve. So we have the vena comitant of the hypoglossal nerve, which runs along the hypoglossal nerve, and it receives the deep lingual vein, as we said. The vena comitant of the lingual artery, the runs along the lingual artery, okay, it receives the dorsal lingual veins, and both the vena comitant of the lingual of the hypoglossal and vena comitant of lingual artery, they, are, they unite at the posterior border of the hyoglossus, okay, to form the lingual vein. The lingual vein ends by opening into the large artery of the neck, which is called internal jugular vein. This is the internal jugular vein. So it will, the, uh, all the lingual artery, uh, sorry, the lingual vein will open into the internal jugular vein. So that's about the arteries and veins of the tongue. About the lymph drainage of the tongue, uh, the same three groups as we said with the mouth cavity, submental, sublingual, deep cervical lymph nodes. But in which manner? We'll say that the tip of the tongue, this is the tip of the tongue, will drain into the submental lymph nodes. While the anterior two-thirds of the tongue will open into the submandibular lymph nodes, while the posterior third of the tongue will open in the deep cervical lymph nodes. Okay? But we should note that the margin of the tongue will open into the submandibular or deep cervical lymph nodes on the same side. While the central part of the tongue drain into the submandibular and deep cervical on two sides. What is the importance of this? The importance of this in malignant tumors. If we have malignant tumor arise from the margin of the tongue, okay, the, the malignant cells will be drained to the submandibular lymph nodes on the same side only. Okay? While if the tumor in the center of the tongue, we should explore the submandibular lymph nodes in, two, uh, in both sides because the, the lymph from the central part will, will reach the submandibular lymph nodes on both sides and same with the deep cervical lymph nodes in the posterior third. Okay, so that's about the lymphatic drainage of the tongue. Now about the salivary, so we finished talking about the oral cavity as a whole. We talked about the, uh, we talked about the boundaries of the oral cavity. We talked about the divisions of the oral cavity. We talked about the nerve supply of the oral cavity and the blood supply of the oral cavity. Then we discussed the teeth and, uh, and tongue in detail. Now we'll talk about the salivary glands. Salivary glands, they are, they are glands with ducts. I mean exocrine glands, okay? Which is, uh, which is concerned by secretion of the saliva into the oral cavity. And uh, the salivary glands are divided into major glands, like the parotid submandibular sublingual. Look to this. This is the major gland. This is the parotid gland. Okay? This is the submandibular gland. And this is the sublingual gland. They are called major salivary glands. They are they are uh, the the uh, uh, they are in pairs. We have pair of parotid gland, pair of submandibular gland, pair of sub of sublingual gland. Okay, we have other minor salivary glands. Minor salivary glands are small glands. Okay, they are scattered in the lips. Okay, to form labial glands. They are scattered in the cheeks, buccal glands, in the soft palate, palatine glands, and in the tongue, lingual glands. Let's discuss the major salivary gland. Number one, the parotid gland. Okay, this is our parotid gland. Just we'll note what is the size. It is the largest one of the three. Okay, what is the shape? It's pyramidal in shape, as we see it here. It's pyramidal, like pyramid. It's located between uh, between the mastoid process here and the ramus of mandible here. So it's located here in this area. In this area. Okay, about its duct. This is very important to know its duct. This is the duct of the parotid gland. It's about five centimeters. Okay, it runs from the anterior border of the parotid gland on the surface of this quadrangular muscle, which is called masseter. Then it will pierce this muscle, the muscle of the cheek, which is called paxinator, to open here. We are outside, to the, uh, outside to the teeth, as we said before, in the vestibule of the mouth. Opposite which tooth? Opposite the upper second molar. So it's five centimeters. It opens in the vestibule of the mouth opposite the upper second molar, and we said this before. About the nerve supply of parotid gland, uh, just let's know the name of the nerves. Uh, the sensory innervation of the parotid gland, the capsule of the parotid gland, the, the parotid gland contains a capsule, outer capsule. This outer capsule is, uh, is supplied by a nerve called the great auricular nerve, arises from cervical two and three spinal segments, called the great auricular nerve. 
while the parenchyma, the inside of the parotid gland, it's supplied by a nerve called auriculotemporal nerve. This auriculotemporal nerve is a branch of the mandibular nerve, branch of trigeminal nerve, so fifth cranial nerve. Okay, so this is the sensory innervation. About the parasympathetic innervation, you know all the cerebral gland receives sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation to act in harmony to, to stimulate the secretion of the cerebral glands. The parasympathetic innervation comes from the glossopharyngeal nerve, the ninth cranial nerve, while the sympathetic innervation comes from the superior cervical ganglion of the sympathetic chain. This is called the sympathetic chain. The, the uppermost ganglion of the sympathetic chain is called superior cervical ganglion. And this gives all the sympathetic to the head and neck. Any structure head and neck sympathetic arise from this superior cervical ganglion. So the superior cervical ganglion of the sympathetic chain supplies the parotid gland. So this is about its nerve supply. About the submandibular gland, where it's located? Located in the neck, okay? In the region called submandibular triangle of the neck, okay? What about the submandibular duct? This is the submandibular gland, okay? The submandibular duct, duct also five centimeters, but it runs from below Airport, and this is very important to know. Note the course of the submandibular duct, it comes from below airport, like this. Okay, it's about five centimeters also, and it opens in the floor of the mouth. Anti gravity, uh, again, the gravity from below airport. Okay, so it's open, it's open airport. Okay, at the summit of the sublingual babella, which side of the frenulum of the tongue, as we said before. What about the sublingual gland? The sublingual gland is located in the floor of the mouth, just beneath the floor of the mouth, beneath the mucous membrane in the sublingual fold. Okay, it, uh, how, how about its duct? It has no single duct, it has multiple ducts, from 4 to, to, uh, to 20 fine ducts. And they open in the floor of the mouth on the surface of the sublingual fold, as we said before. About the nerve supply of the submandibular and sublingual cerebral gland, both together, the sensory innervation comes from the lingual nerve, same like the tongue. Okay, with branch of mandibular, branch of trigeminal. About the parasympathetic innervation, the parasympathetic innervation comes from the corda tympani, also like the tongue, from the corda tympani, branch of facial, the seventh cranial nerve. About the sympathetic innervation, like any structure in the neck from the superior cervical ganglion. Uh, about the nature of secretion of the glands, of the major glands, uh, it's very important to know that the parotid gland Okay, it contains just serous SNI, so it, uh, its secretion is serous secretion, uh, while the sub uh, the sublingual gland contains mucous SNI, so the secretion is mucous thick secretion. Submandibular gland contains mixed SNI, so it has mixed secretion. Okay, and the question here, uh, we have very important clinical situation called uh, uh, called salivary stones formation. You know, any, any fluid in the body is salts dissolved in water. If the salt increases in concentration, the salt can participate, okay? Can, sorry, can precipitate. If it precipitate, it will form a hard subject. This hard subject is called stones. Like what? Like the urinary tract. We have urinary stones. Like what? Like the gall stones, the stones in the gallbladder or in the biliary tract. Like here, like the, sal or like the saliva. The saliva is water with salts inside it so uh, so the some some uh, in some situations this hard uh, uh, object can obstruct uh, the sal the salivary tract uh, or, or the salivary ducts uh, to form something called salivary stones okay and the question here which one of the three glands is more prone to stone formation okay which one it's the submandibular okay why we have multiple uh, causes, okay? Uh, like what? Like one anatomical fact I told you about, like the direction of the uh, of the, of the drainage, of the direction of uh, of saliva, uh, of of the drainage of saliva. The submandibular gland it runs, uh, the submandibular duct runs from below airport. It's anti gravity, so it's more prone to stone formation. It's unlike to the parotid. And the sub so one of the causes, the duct, the tongue of the submandibular gland is long and anti-gravity flow. Okay, while the parotid contains just watery secretion and it runs, uh, it, it doesn't run against the gravity. While the sublingual duct is short and uh, and many ducts, so they are not prone to uh, to obstruction. Also, the nature of the secretion, like the the saliva, the saliva of the uh, of the submandibular, is thicker than the parotid. 
Deposits alkaline contain high, high concentration of calcium and phosphate and mucus content more than the parotid. So this is why the submandibular gland is more prone to stone formation. So that's about the parotid, uh, that's about the cerebral gland in general, and this is all what you need to know about it uh, now. Okay, now we'll talk about the esophagus. What is the esophagus? The esophagus is a narrow muscular tube, like this narrow muscular tube. It's concerned with uh, food passage or, or transfer of food from the pharynx to the stomach. Okay. About its length, it's about 10 inches, 25 centimeters. It belongs to the 10 inch family. Uh, you know that we have some organs in the body uh, with 10 inches, like what? Like the esophagus, like the ureter, like the duodenum. They are all 10 inches. So the esophagus is 10 inches, about 25 centimeters. Okay. About its beginning, it begins as continuation of the pharynx, continuation of the pharynx, okay? Where, what is the vertebral level of this? At the level of C6, cervical 6, okay? So it's continuation of the pharynx at the lower border of C6. This is the beginning of the esophagus. What about its course? Its course, it runs first above the sternum here, I mean in the neck. So this part above the sternum is called cervical part, okay? Then it will run throughout the thoracic cavity, it's called thoracic part. Then it will pierce the diaphragm to run for a short distance in the abdomen, it's called abdominal part. So it has cervical, thoracic, and abdominal part. Okay, so this is the cervical part, or cervical part, this is the uh, thoracic part, and this is the abdominal part here. Okay. About the termination, I will add, I will uh, mention two points. First, it will pierce the diaphragm where? At the level of T10. So it pierces the diaphragm at the level of T10. Okay, to form an opening in the diaphragm called esophageal opening of the diaphragm. Okay, so esophageal opening or esophageal orifice on the diaphragm at the level of T10. Then it will open in the stomach at the opening of a stomach called cardiac end of the stomach. So it will open at the cardiac end of the stomach at the level of T11. Okay, so this is about the termination of the esophagus. And here I show you where is the esophageal opening. This is the esophageal opening of the diaphragm. This one. This is the esophageal opening of the diaphragm. Okay. This is the esophageal opening of the diaphragm, which lies at the level of T10. Okay. It's surrounded by a muscular sling called right cross of diaphragm. Then, uh, so the constriction shows four constriction or four sides of constriction. Number one, at the beginning. Okay. It's it's located 15 centimeters from the incisor. Number two, opposite the arch of the aorta, it's about 25 centimeters from incisor. So, so we locate the site of the constriction by the, the length or the distance from the incisors. Okay, so 15 centimeters from the incisors, this is the beginning of the esophagus. Okay, about 23 centimeters from the incisors, opposite the arch of the aorta, about 25 centimeters, opposite the left bronchus. And lastly, here at the esophageal opening of the diaphragm, the distance is 14 centimeters from the incisors. So it's, this is very important sites, and uh, and it carries clinical importance during instrumentation of the esophagus. When we insert uh, an instrument in the esophagus, like the like the gastroscope or the endoscope, so we insert the endoscope from the mouth cavity. So we should locate the distance from the from the incisors. So number one. 15 centimeters, this is the beginning, number two, opposite the arch, 20, 23 centimeters, opposite the left bronchus, about 25 centimeters, and lastly, the esophageal opening of the diaphragm. Uh, about the swallowing, or the process of the swallowing, we should know that the process of swallowing occurs on three phases. The, the first phase is called oral phase. The oral phase, when the bolus of food is pushed backward, okay, by the action of the muscles of the tongue, which muscles of the tongue move the tongue backward, it's called styloglossus. So this is called oral phase. Then the pharyngeal phase, when the bolus of food will push through the pharynx downward into the esophagus. Okay, and this requires to close all the opening, like the or like the oropharyngeal isthmus. Okay, to prevent this bolus to return to the uh, this pol to prevent the bolus to return to the oral cavity, and we will close the nasopharyngeal isthmus, which is the opening between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx by the soft palate, and we will close also the the laryngeal orifice to prevent this bolus of food to enter into the larynx, so this bolus of food will push in through the esophagus. Then the esophageal phase, when the uh, when this uh, when the food will pass along the esophagus to the stomach, so this is the phases of swallowing. 
Uh, lastly, about the blood supply of the tongue, uh, sorry, blood supply of the esophagus. We have arteries and we have veins. What are the arterial supply of the esophagus? We have uh, the cervical part of the esophagus. This part is supplied by this artery. What is this artery? It's called inferior thyroid artery. So this is the inferior thyroid artery, which comes from the thyrocervical trunk. Okay, so th th supply the cervical part of the esophagus. While the thoracic part of the esophagus supplies by branches from the descending thoracic aorta. So this is the descending thoracic aorta that supplies the thoracic part of the esophagus. Lastly, the abdominal part of the esophagus by branches from the left gastric artery. Same with the veins. The cervical part of the esophagus drains into the brachiocephalic veins. This is the brachiocephalic veins. While the thoracic part of the, eso uh, of the esophagus by the azygous and hemiazygous. This is the azygous, which lies on the right side. And this is the hemiazygous, the two hemiazygous, superior and inferior, on the left side. Okay. Lastly, lastly, this part, the abdominal part of the esophagus, okay, from the left gastric vein. So that's about the venous drainage of the tongue. So that's all uh, we illustrated. Uh, we talked about the mouth cavity. We talked about the cerebral gland. We talked about the esophagus. Uh, hope you find this uh, this presentation simple and useful for you. Thank you for your listening. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In this jar, uh, we can see the boundaries of the mouth cavity. We know that the roof of the mouth cavity is formed by the heart palate, the HP. Okay. Behind the heart palate, we have the soft palate, SP. The terminal part of the soft palate is called uvula, U. Okay. Uh, while here, we can see the tongue. This is the tongue. We can see one of the muscles of the tongue which arise from the, the superior genial tubercle of the mandible and its fan shape is called genioglossus gg this is the genioglossus the largest muscle of the tongue okay. in this jar we can see uh, some of the salivary gland like the parotid gland uh, the parotid gland which lies between the mastoid process this is the parotid gland it lies between the mastoid process posteriorly and the remus of mandible anteriorly and we can see from the anterior border of the parotid gland we have something called the parotid duct this is the duct of the parotid gland this one this is the duct of the parotid gland which runs forward from the anterior border of the parotid gland to pierce the vaccinator muscle to open in the vestibule of the mouth over the upper second molar tooth okay in the jar also we can see the submandibular gland this is the submandibular gland here this is the submandibular gland this is the superficial part of the submandibular gland Okay, in the, this jar we can see the esophagus. The esophagus begins above as the continuation of the pharynx at the level of, the, of C6. Then it descends for a small part in the neck, it's called cervical part. Then it descends in the thorax. Okay, in the upper part it, it descends in the superior mediastinum behind the trachea. Then it descends in the posterior mediastinum uh, behind uh, the heart and pericardium. Okay, then it will pierce the diaphragm here. Okay. Pierce the diaphragm here at the esophageal opening of the diaphragm, which lies at the level of T10. Uh, then a small part of the esophagus will run in the abdominal cavity. Okay, this is called uh, abdominal esophagus. Uh, the esophagus ends by opening in the cardiac end of the stomach at the level of T11. Okay, so this uh, this shows the course of the esophagus. This jar also shows uh, shows the thoracic part of the esophagus, which runs first behind the trachea, then it runs in the posterior mediastinum behind the heart and pericardium. And we can notice here the, the relation between the esophagus and the descending aorta, where the esophagus cross in front of the descending aorta at the level of T7. This is a very important relation.